three straight victories, a little bit of air has been deflated out of the balloon of optimism that was growing surrounding Norwich City at this moment in time. One nil defeat to Sunderland on Sunday has left them outside of the top six again and probably exposed their inconsistencies again. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. In association with Future Radio, I'm Connor Southall, joined by Paddy Davitt to pick the bones out of what was a frustrating afternoon at Carrow Road, shall we say. I mean, Paddy, let's let's start with the... Well, maybe, maybe let's start with how the league table looks because it... This felt like an opportunity for Norwich City to move away from from the pack somewhat. They they would have gone fifth with a victory here today. They would have leapfrogged Millwall, who they obviously beat last week in pretty impressive fashion, and we were all uh, glowing. Uh, we were all giving them glowing praise after that victory. They would have also gone ahead of Blackburn in the table as well. But also, and perhaps more crucially in this argument, they'd have pushed further away. They'd have been what four points from from West Brom, five from Coventry in ninth, even more five from. From Sunderland, or even more than that, because they picked up three points this afternoon. But but certainly a bigger gap to Sunderland in tenth. Angus Gunn spoke after the game about the fact that when these opportunities arrive, it feels increasingly like Norwich City fail to take them. Have we seen a reason today as to why Norwich City are where they are in this table? That inconsistency that we keep seeing from this group of players. Because I think if they've proven one thing over the course of this season, is that you absolutely cannot hang your head on the uh, can, cannot hang your hat on them to produce a performance. Absolutely, and that in the context of, you know, we'll get past, obviously, the events today, Sunday at Car Road and a defeat, but Tony Mowbray, the opposition manager who's plotted that win, was still of the mind that Norwich will, when push comes to shove, be in the top six. Um, you know, you can debate that after what we've seen unfold at Car Road, but if you take him at his word, and they are in the top six, then the types of game that they've fallen down in too often this season is probably going to be what they need to navigate themselves past and that's the probably in terms of the bigger picture it's a blow but it's a dent rather than a, a fatal sort of um, you know blow being inflicted by, by losing at Oakland Sunderland I just think it opens them up again to that more of that self-doubt um, on the pitch off the pitch around the club Um the, around the frailties that we've seen in this group of players and just when you think they're, they're answering those questions definitively today they're going for a fourth straight car road home win they you know did what they had to do at Millwall uh, you know to counteract some of the sort of narrative around they, they haven't been able to perform against clubs in and around the, the top end of the table um, and you thought right okay yep yeah, under this head coach this group of players they get something put in their way, they can climb over it. But um, today felt like they fell down again. And, uh, you know, Wagner himself, very, very honest and very open after the game. The best team won. His team were nowhere near the levels they needed to be. And the problem is to get to that end destination, which was not just to get into the playoffs, but then to come through the playoffs, they're going to have to find a way to deal with good teams because inevitably you get into the playoffs or you get into the top six, you will be facing good teams because they've also shown that staying power and, and probably hitting it with momentum as well. You know, you look at what Middlesbrough are doing. If they fall short of the top two, they're going to be a tricky test. Luton been in and around it last season. That they're, they're coming through again um, with a certain former Norwich striker banging in goals left, right and centre and Carlton Morris and Millwall won again this weekend, I think I'm right in saying, after, you know, having a setback to Norwich. So, and then, as you rightly say, Connor, in the rear view now, and, and not that far in the rear view, is is West Brom, is Sunderland, um, Coventry. Um, yeah, it, it, it feels like um, if you're not picking up points now at this stage, whether it be a draw or a win every weekend, you're losing ground and your margin for error gets narrower and narrower. So... Yeah, I guess we have to separate out the status in terms of the table and what this result means for that, because it isn't terminal by any stretch of the imagination, but it's the feeling around it and those feelings that you can't kind of shed when you see Norwich turn in such a laboured, sluggish, lethargic display as they did against Sunderland, that maybe this group isn't going to be good enough in the final analysis and Maybe we are going to be back at that, which we feared, certainly when Dean Smith left, a summer of upheaval and a summer of transition and summer of surgery required. 
um, to equip this this group of players or whoever the group would be moving forward to be good enough to be viable candidates for promotion. Uh, and if it's not going to be this season, then it you'd hope it would be next. But you know, maybe you know, maybe Wagner's tone I think was right post match where he said, "Look, I I certainly didn't get carried away with Millwall. I didn't for one minute think every positive result meant." Everything was great in the garden, and so I'm not going to go and flip the other way. And after a poor result and a poor display, feel that everything is now suddenly negative, uh, and that there aren't any shoots of recovery. I think we've seen enough to know that isn't the case. But when we all thought, "Poor, this this is only going to go one way now," after Millwall, unfortunately, it's re- regressed the other way, and that's a bit of a sobering thought. I think this evening. Yeah, I, I would I would agree, and we could, we could spend the majority, the vast majority of this podcast speaking about why Norwich is so inconsistent, why this team has that face to them where they can produce a performance like that. We saw it a few weeks ago at Wigan, we saw it at Bristol City, we saw it, and that's just in David Wagner's reign. We've, Burnley was a little bit different because that was individual errors and there was a, a different quality of opponent there. We saw it throughout, obviously, Dean Smith's tenure, uh, probably full stop, but certainly in, in the first half of this campaign. So we, we could talk about that, but I think you just have to kind of accept that that is what this Norwich side is. They've shown that this season. There's a big body of evidence there to suggest that they are consistently inconsistent. They are capable of producing a performance of the level that, that we've seen. And and so almost that probably makes you reframe the debate because knowing that, that this Norwich side has that in their locker, it's now about navigating that. And that's the challenge for David Wagner, isn't it? It's about ensuring that that type of performance, which this group has produced, produced it again today, is as few and and far between as possible, which is a different difficult test. And you know the fact that after they they had the last one of these performances against Wigan, they should have lost that game. They drew it by all accounts. They went on a a decent run um, and have gone on a decent run since their last defeat against Bristol City. So I understand why everything feels so heightened and why there is such a willingness to be reactive to this result and suggest that because they've lost to Sunderland, that means they're not good enough to get in, into the playoffs. And I, I think I've been fairly consistent in my view that I feel they'll fall just just short. And I think we've, we, we've probably said that a few times on, on this podcast. Hopefully, obviously, we're, we're proven wrong. But that's probably why I'm looking at it a little bit more philosophically because actually, you're right what you say, it is just a dent. It, this defeat does not mean that they're going to get in the top six just as last week's win against Millwall didn't mean that they were. There's a, there's a happy medium between this kind of constant bounce, bouncing between emotions that we've seen throughout this season, I think. Yeah, and that's where Wagner will now, and his coaching staff particularly over these coming days, will have to be very good. They're almost trying to maintain that equilibrium in terms of how they approach things, how they process this defeat, how they get them ready to go again in very short order at Huddersfield on Wednesday. Um, and then the small matter of Alex Neal and Stoke away to finish this week. So it won't get any easier or any less probing, these tests. Um, and the fact that, you know, over the piece, 10 league games, I think we're, we are now into the Wagner reign. Six wins, a draw and three defeats, if I'm not mistaken. So, overall, the trend there is positive. That You know, the curve is upward. Um, the points tally is 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 a very decent haul. And replicated over these final 10 games, is it now, I think, that will get him in the top six, I'm pretty sure. Because, ultimately, you know, Luton, Millwall, Blackburn, they've all exhibited, you know these kind of ups and downs. Um, I'd say it's only Middlesbrough, really, outside of the top two, who have shown that real consistent seam over a long period of time. And even they had, you know, they've had the odd result mixed in there. But, you know, I I don't think for a minute now that we're going to see a Luton, a Millwall, um, a Sunderland, a Coventry, a Blackburn go on a, you know, an unbroken win, winning run between now and the end of the season. So... Yeah, it isn't. I don't think today, today um, would indicate that Norwich aren't capable of getting in the top six. It's if they got into the top six, are they equipped then to really handle in sudden death football um, the challenge that Tony Mowbray and, and his coaching staff were able to deconstruct, which is essentially, as Burnley did, tried that high press and Norwich, well, it was graphic graphically imploded for me in the first 25 minutes you know the the Zara McLean access which has been so good in certain types of games wasn't able to handle it the the energy the intensity the the vigor that Sunderland set about it in that area of the pitch that then meant the the back four were 
uh, worryingly exposed. Um, you had Max Aaron's really tough afternoon against Jack Clark and the two centre backs, as as was proven by the match winning goal. Uh, you know they they weren't able to go and lock on to their respective opponents. Um, he, even Yunulis, I felt struggle with Patrick Roberts, who looked a different Patrick Roberts to the one who was here in, in that loan spell a couple of seasons, three seasons ago or so. Um, and then at the top end of the pitch, because because the flow of the game was was lapping towards Angus Gunn's goal with 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 alarming sort of frequency, you know, Ida and Pookie, they just they were just isolated figures, and it was essentially it was almost like the whole pack of cards um, turned in, and um, and for it to be that that visibly um, second best would would trouble you, I think that. You know, is there is there some fundamental flaws now in this Wagner tactical template? As much as we you know we've praised him rightly um, for how he's marshaled his players and how he's picked the right players for the right games over the entirety of these ten games. You know, against Burnley and now against Sunderland, both of them at Car Road. Obviously, um, Norwich have looked. You know, it's probably not too hard to say clueless when a team has pressed them that high. They haven't been able, either on the pitch, the players and their own individual responsibility, or Wagner and his coaching staff off the pitch looking at it from the side. They've not been able to counteract that. And um, and you can guarantee that all the opponents they'll play from now on in, and certainly if they got into a playoff scenario, they will look at how a Tony Mowbray set his team up, how a Vincent Company set their team up, and think, well, if we do likewise, there's a very high proportion, we, we, will, we will nullify what Norwich are good at. And that we will, as Mowbray said in his post-match presser, because they, they like to build from the back, that means they play high-risk football. And if you can turn the ball over, then you're one pass away from a from a shot. Um, and that proved to be the case on more than one occasion this afternoon. So, you know, I think it's a reminder that while Wagner has made great strides with this group, um, he, he now has to almost come up with another tactical revision or a tweak um, as much as his players need to be able to deconstruct what's happening in front of their eyes on the pitch, because you know, for 25 minutes, I thought in that first half there, it was just um, well quite painful really to watch that Sunderland was so dominant and able to get so much ascendancy um, from from you know a, a style of play which you would like to think now, particularly after you know the way Burnley exposed them, that, that Wagner and his coaching staff would be able to counteract that, but. You know, quite clearly that that wasn't the case today, and uh, you know I think moving forward in terms of a playoff type scenario, that that would be concerning, and maybe that cuts to the heart of what you said earlier on, Connor, is that you know is it these group of players and they're not able? Maybe it, maybe it isn't a case that Wagner isn't imparting what they need to do to counteract a high press. Is it that this group of players are seemingly incapable of of, of implementing that? In which case, you know, it's hard to see that if they come up against that type of challenge tactically uh, in a playoff scenario will they be able to come up with the answers um, because the, the two times most clearly in in this 10 game cycle when they have faced that challenge they've fallen short both times and that is a worry because I'm sure if you know if it was Michael Carrick and Middlesbrough for example in the in the playoffs over two legs um, they will look at it and they will think well we can do the same and of course they've you know, albeit it was Dean Smith, they've come to Car Road and won already this season. And Norwich still have to go to Middlesbrough, it's worth pointing out, and Blackburn as well. So, and Sheffield United have got to come here. So, you know, there's pl- put it this way, there's plenty of opportunities between now and the end of the season, if it was to be a playoff push, where Wagner can come up with something a little bit different. Because, you know, I, I watched that today and I thought, well, you know, until they can find the answers to, to counteract this high press, then... I, I don't see how they can navigate a, a path to the Premier League because they're going to face this again and it'll be good sides who will be setting these traps again as it was Sunderland today, as it was Burnley previously and against the better sides in this division implementing that type of uh, te- tactical template uh, they've been found wanting. You know, It's one thing if Hull come here or Cardiff come here and try and press them but they're not able to sustain it. They don't have the quality of player to be able to sustain it. They're not as cohesive in terms of what they're doing collectively as well as individually. Sunderland were today, as were Burnley previously, and Norwich were found wanting. Which is why so much there was so much talk about their record against the top teams in in this league. I think it's obviously there are only two wins against teams in the top six have come against Millwall, which is why there is so much 
conversation and talk about that because actually their record against the rest of the division not too bad not too bad pretty good or, or um, they're, they're kind of beating the teams in mid-table they're beating the teams at the wrong end of the table actually it's been the record against the top teams be it with Dean Smith in charge be it with David Wagner in charge that has that has proved difficult and and kind of you mentioned the tactical setup there and I think it's it's an interesting conversation I think what I would add to it is you, you kind of look at both sort of halves I guess of the season if you want to do it like that and both coaches for all the flaws that the Dean Smith had in terms of his inability to really engineer and uh, and make visible a, a kind of tactical style David Wagner has done the opposite there is a clear tactical style but actually the the constant between both of those that maybe is the reason that that Norwich find themselves where they are is those individual errors that would point to quality that wouldn't point to a tactical kind of setup and there was a real clamour for kind of a sense of identity around this Norwich group. So if you want an identity, you have to accept that Norwich are going to play in a very formulaic way, a way that is visible on the eye. And that means it's visible to opponents as well. And that means they are going to come to Carrow Road and set up in the way that Tony Mowbray described. And you're right, it's it's about finding solutions to that. And when you throw in the comments from, from David Wagner earlier this season about a group being unable to cope with adversity, and we saw that today to an extent, they conceded a goal and for 20 minutes afterwards, it was like all hell broke loose. They completely lost their heads. All kind of, all semblance of structure and identity went out of the window. So I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? And it comes back to the core of this kind of conversation about inconsistency and about why this group has underperformed. And even if they went up through the playoffs, I think there would be some people who felt that was an underperformance given the quality of, uh, of their squad. Because of that very fact, the fact they are making so many individual errors, no team in the Championship has made more errors leading to shots. All of these statistics are things that are very difficult for coaches to get out of, of teams. It feels like it's kind of innate it's it's an attribute that coaches really find difficult to grapple with and all of the hard work that David Wagner has done so far and you listed his record earlier on has got Norwich City just into the top six now they're out again they've got all of that work to make up ground that that's kind of the work that they've done so far and actually you you look at the games that remain they've they've got uh what was it probably six games five games maybe against teams towards the lower end of the division, probably, yeah, probably five if you include Stoke. They've, they've still got to go to West Brom. They've still got to go to Middlesbrough, Sheffield United at home as well, Blackburn away. It's going to be those games that tell us whether or not this Norwich City group are going to be able to get into the playoffs, not those not those games against the teams in the, in the lower end of the, of the table. Whether that gets them into the playoffs is a different conversation because actually they may well amass enough wins against those teams at the wrong end of the table to get them in the playoffs. But I actually think it's going to be the performances and the results against... Middlesbrough, Sheffield United, Blackburn, West Brom that are going to tell us how they're going to fare from here because we can talk about whether they're not, they're going to get in the top six or, or whether they're whether they're not. But actually, if they can't break that cycle, if they can't change that, and Sunderland are, are obviously tenth, but they've been around the top six all season, then certainly talk of promotion feels far fetched. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. Um, but then. I'll go back. We can just get us get ourselves in the time machine and go back to just over a week ago, post Millwall, and um, you know most people's world view of Norwich would have been after that um, almost almost without being arrogant that the top six was as a done deal, and now it was just building that momentum um, to hit those playoffs with the go forward thrust that you you tend to associate with the teams who who come through that successfully. And go all the way and 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 finish it off at Wembley, um, so again it's it's kind of ver- veering between these two contrasting extremes of emotion, um, which you know we can do in the media and the fan base can obviously do as well. But Wagner particularly and those players especially that they need to if they can detach themselves from that, and of course they'll need to you know debrief this one pretty swiftly given the turnaround to Huddersfield Wednesday. But they they. And it might even be now, as I think about it, as I'm as, as I'm talking here, that you know you get this game out of the way, you get Stoke out of the way, and then it's the international break, isn't it? If I've got my dates yeah. right, so and and that's a two week window. Now, if I don't know four from six, ideally six from six, then you get yourself to that period, and you're. I, I would even say they don't even need to be in the top six. I think well, as I long as say, they get in, enough in of or a around. Return. Yeah, yeah, in or around. If you were you were you were within touching distance of the top six, 
what I'm saying is that you could then get to that two week period and then Wagner would have an opportunity then in his own mind with his coaching staff to 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 freed from the the cycle of games and, and training for games almost plan this now plan this ahead that okay well we've been found out in this game here today we were found out very similarly against Burnley what can we come up with now in that two week window uh, almost a brainstorming session freed from the the cycle of having to sort of win games to to make up lost ground or or just to maintain your position um, to equip this group of players that we can actually implement in the time that's left the other side of the international break um, to try and to try and break this cycle that that they feel they're in that they take a step forward they get pulled back they take a step forward they get pulled back again and if they're not able to sort of um, you know come up with something um, then it, it, it is very hard to, to feel that when push comes to shove, uh, and even if they manage to get themselves into the playoffs, that that whether it was a you know a Sunderland or a a Luton or a, or a Millwall again, um, or heaven forbid for me a Middlesbrough, um, Blackburn as well, that you know can can you see this group of players prevailing over a two legged semi final or or a one off game, um, and over the entirety of the ten games this. That we've seen under Wagner, you know they'd have a good go. You know they'd they'd give it everything. Um, but have they when it when when it really comes on top? And that was a very point, good point you made there, Connor. That when they fell behind again for fifteen twenty minutes, the wheels came off. And there's experienced players on that pitch today in green and yellow, and they wasn't able to get hold of that game at all. They were they were run ragged. They were they were the shape was all over the place the, the gaps between the players the different individual units the defence midfield forward line and that's not a, that's not a streetwise Sunderland that was a very young um, high energy high intensity Sunderland but still not it wasn't to contrast that with Burnley it wasn't Premier League grade been over this course and distance the Ashley Barnes type players um, you know Roberts uh, those type of players but Norwich still were were looking like they were just clinging on at points, and if it wasn't for Angus Gunn made a couple of stops there, that then they you know they could have, the game could have been over over and done with by half time. And you just think in a play we keep talking about it, and, and again we're not we're not assuming that they're they're, they're going to get there. But but if it was a playoff scenario in a two legged semi final, you're going to be taken into some deep water at some point in those two games. Can this group basically? keep their head above water to, to butcher this analogy and and basically come come through that and 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 impose themselves on the opponent um and the evidence unfortunately is, is racking up the other way that even under Wagner and, and and everything that he's brought to the party that Dean Smith was lacking uh, in terms of the, you know leaving a positive imprint on this group of players it would it still be enough uh, in these sort of scenarios particularly when you know there is no tomorrow if you get to the playoffs. You know, it, it'll be over and it'll be game over, uh, you know, if they fall short as they did against Burnley, against Sunderland. So, you know, they're playing under stress. Now, That that's the other thing I'd say. They're, they're playing under stress partially because they had to make up ground, but also because, you know, the, there's other clubs trying to mount a run. And, and, and all, I mean, Tony Mowbray was very keen to dismiss that. He basically said they've got 52 points now as it is, uh, and that's them safe from relegation. But... But you can guarantee privately he he will think that if Sunderland get on a good run, they can make a little run for the playoffs. And if they can from their position, then all the clubs above them, including Norwich, will be in the same boat. So that brings a, a stress now that as much as Wagner, again, reiterated it after today's game, look, it's about performances. With performances will come results. Will, with results will come the league position, i.e. they'll all take care of themselves if they get the performance. But unfortunately now at this stage you are going to have to continually be looking at where you are in the league standings, where you are relative to other clubs, what runs other clubs are mounting now, because you know it, it will swiftly get to the point that they'll run out of games and they'll run out of opportunities to put the performances together to get themselves into the top six. You know, If they can't get past the type of challenge that Sunderland have set for them today um, and just come through it, I mean, just roll with the punches in that first half, you know, Get in at the break, you know, level at worst, and and then you know Wagner can get to work at half time and deconstruct it, and they come out better. But but even you know, 
if we move it on to the actual way the game broke down today, second half, how how busy was the was the Sunderland keeper? I don't recall him having to make too many saves. If anything, the best save he made was the Max Aaron's one near post, mm. um, which was in the first half. You know, there was one from Puki, a pretty tame volley from a Yanulis cutback in the second half. But other than that, um, criminally underworked from a Norwich perspective. And and so again, it's almost as if they were still reeling individually, collectively. They couldn't clear their heads. And and yes, they of course had a had a bit of a go second half, allied to Sunderland clearly getting into more of a protective mode and, and re- retreating back towards their own goal. But, um, but you know, they didn't have to work that hard, really, to preserve that win. So, you know, that that is concerning, that, that almost the psychological element of this, the, 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 the bruise that is left on this Norwich group of players uh, when they suffer an adversity against a very good team who, who are able to press home that advantage, in contrast to maybe Hull or some of the other teams who've, who've given them uncomfortable moments but Norwich have prevailed um, you know that those questions aren't going to go away until and and maybe it's a good thing that you've touched on it already Connor that it is Blackburn it is Sheffield United it is Middlesbrough because if Norwich can find a way in those type of games against that type of opponent then maybe they'll start to answer these questions as they had started to do in terms of the Cara Road form or dealing with adversity, playing against sides in and around the top end of the table. They'd all, they'd started to shift the narrative, but unfortunately a result like Sunderland and the manner of the defeat as well, in terms of how they've performed, those questions come back again and, and they will persist until you know we see some tangible evidence against the top, top sides in this division that, no, hold on, yep, we're starting now to see that when push comes to shove, you can almost rely on this group. And unfortunately, I think Sunderland again today has, has underlined for me, you can't definitively rely on this group to, to come through the type of test that they will inevitably face over the running, but more pertinently, if they get there, the playoffs as well. Yeah, and the, the frustration for me today was the goal. Uh, actually, bef- actually, before that, I'd, they weren't doing exceptionally well. I think that would be a stretch, but they were, they were doing okay. They, they manufactured, you, you mentioned the, the errant chance. They had quite a bit of the ball quite a bit of territory it didn't warrant the response that we saw which was just total chaos and and a real erraticness and then no one who was really grasping it and actually probably what it needed was just to say okay yep we've conceded let's let's keep going with with what we're going maintain the structure maintain what they, they were trying to do and it was it was just like they lost all all sense of 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 where they were and who they were and what they were trying to do it's it's so utterly bizarre but equally uh, as it affects them adversely when they concede it also affects them positively when they score and they have a moment like that and it feels like then they they really push the accelerator down in moments we saw that probably last weekend in in the patch um between the second and the third goal at Millwall so it is is so bizarre and, and I'm not really I was trying to think um before we before we hit record I'm not sure I've seen a side that is and it seems like a bizarre statement to make, but is that affected by goals? You, you usually feel like there's some sort of consistency when you can see the goal, and and, and you you know we've seen teams before, good Norwich teams, bad Norwich teams, who have either been able to clear their heads or are just as rubbish as they were when they when they conceded or, or before they conceded. So the fact they lurch after they concede a goal is is so bizarre and really quite frustrating. And again, it goes back to. Something that Wagner had identified and then went public with it after, you know, probably it was the Burnley game, I can't remember exactly, but, but this this feeling that he, very early on, has obviously detected from observing them at close quarters in training, um, in games, that, you know, when there is an adverse situation, that they're not able to, to you know, handle that. And that, and that, and that for me, is is surprising because there is the core group of the Hanleys, the Aarons, the even Krull not playing, but but still in and around the group, in and around the change room. McC- McLean, you know. Well, look at look at the spine of their team. Hanley, Gibson. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head how many championship appearances they've got. Yeah. Kenny McLean, Temu Puki. You should have enough experience in that side just to settle things down when you can see the goal like today. It probably didn't warrant the reaction that we saw no. where it went nuclear, basically, in terms of their performance levels. And, but, yeah, and the point is that I know the last two times at this level they've won the title but by no manner of means did they have everything their own way on both of those ascents you know there was 
it was a really good trait, wasn't it, of Daniel Farkas' last title yeah. winning side, that they were able actually to stare adversity in the face and come through it. I remember games uh, away at Rotherham where, where they won that, where they were really under the cosh. There, there were probably loads of examples that we could that we yeah. could list that I, I won't, but they, they were a really capable group. And actually, you look at it, a, the core of this group isn't, too dissimilar. A lot of the players are the same as that group. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. The actual personnel. Um, now, of course, they've had a couple of scarring uh, brushes with the Premier League in, in 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 interspersed with those successful spells in the Championship. But you know, do, do you know? Do you do you inevitably have to draw the conclusion that that what's gone before this season is is allied maybe too now I think about it that that it maybe those those Premier League bruises maybe they haven't healed you know definitively is that um, a confidence thing is that yeah it yeah. might be yeah because you can because you know they come off a season where you pounded week in week out it felt like um you know you're told you're not good enough you're told you're a bit of a laughing stock you're a bit of a joke you know in certain quarters uh, we all know what the narrative that sprung up around Norwich certainly the second time around in the Premier League um You'd have to you'd have to have pretty thick skin not to have heard that or not to have felt it or not to have to, sort of um, you know let it pierce pierce your, your bubble as it were even though you know at this level of the game these players should be used to that comes with it um, that sort of scrutiny and and the amplification through social media nowadays increasingly but you know is it there is it always there subconsciously you know we're getting into Quite a deep, deep discussion. We're, we're definitely not the right. No, we're definitely not the right. No, we don't. Mike, we need that Matthew Saeed, you know, the chap who's a yeah. He's, a, he's sort of the the brain and the and the, the sort of psychological elements of sport and elite performance. But uh, but that has that has to leave a, a scar or scars. Um, and then me for me though, that's that is one thing you can't d- dispute that that anybody who was part of two pretty bruising Premier League campaigns, it's it's got to have some impact. But it was this season. It was the no. We're going to come back strong. We're going to be you know in the front rank. We're going to be one of the promotion favourites for automatic promotion. Uh, and we all know we all know how it played out. That you know we got to the point where uh, not many days before Christmas, the previous uh, head coach is being told uh, volume volubly by uh, quite a few uh, supporters at Car Road for that Blackburn game that his football isn't particularly good, and that's being polite and. Uh, more toxicity then at, at Luton on Boxing Day, which was eventually the when, when the curtain fell on on that head coach and and um, paved the way for da- David Wagner to walk through the door. But the coach has changed, but the players are still the same, give or take. Yes, okay, they made one or two changes in January in and out the door, but essentially it's the same group of players. And if you know they've had to kind of deal with all that's been thrown at them um, this season. Um, then you know as much as as it felt a very positive turning of the dial under a head coach who really got that need to bring everybody back together and almost you know get the super glue out and bring the fan base back towards the the players and the players closer to the fan base and while there's a hell of a lot of good work been done in that area you know when you get in these very stressful situations of these type of games back end of the season you know every game counts now um against teams who maybe harbour similar ambitions, who aren't going to give you anything easy, when push comes to shove, do these self-doubts sort of rupture to the surface again? And we see it in these phases like falling behind today uh, and what happened in the immediate aftermath, that that they just looked... It was almost panic. It was almost panic, really. I'm typified, and I don't wish to single him out, but Ben Gibson in his own box, playing a square pass behind Grant Hanley, and it rolls out over his byline for a, for a Sunderland corner. I mean, you just can't you can't fathom that an experienced player would would commit that type of error, but it was symptomatic of just a scrambled collective thinking, um, and that doesn't bode well for inevitably the stressful situations they will find down the stretch. Now, when you know they will need to peer inside themselves, and then as individuals and as a group need to find the answers, and it felt like Millwall was a bit of a watershed moment, but a week on, you know, we've been we've been pulled back into a sense that you know maybe there is work to be done and whether Wagner having identified it clearly because he he flagged it whether he feels now he can he can get back inside these players heads and find the answers between now and what's left of the season um who knows time will tell but as i say i, I think the more i think about this now you know if they can if they can navigate Huddersfield and Stoke and add some more points and and they're still kind of in in or around or slightly better than the situation they're in as the league table looks this evening, then 
you know, those two weeks, uh, they could be pivotal because obviously when they resume, I think it's Sheffield United at Car Road, I mean, what a massive game that would be. Uh, you know, from there on, there's no margin for error, really. It has to be full throttle um, because if they fall fall short in any of those games down the stretch, you fear it won't be too long before the game is up and then it will be, you know, unfortunately, what we feared it would be when, when Wagner first came in which is a rebuild job. Um, and that would be disappointing if it if it just sort of tailed off a little bit or tapered off from where we felt we were after the Millwall game. But, you know, such is, such is the championship. Highs and lows within the space of, you know, two 90 minutes, basically. Yeah, and, and, and this all links back to my first point, really, and, and particularly what you said there about this group of players, because... That's why I didn't really, really want to spend too much time speaking about oh why why is this group so inconsistent because I think you and you've explained the reasons there I think really really well I I think we just have to accept that it's part of their makeup because you know, they say ten games left we're going to have to accept that there are there's going to be another performance like this there's probably going to be another two three performances like this down the down the track so yeah we we almost have to. To add that to the, to the to the equation, I'm sure David Wagner is learning as well that, he, that that that's a side of his team now. He's he's seen it on a few occasions already, and in many ways, he'll learn far more about his group in in, in games like today, in games like Wigan away and uh, and Bristol City where where they lost as well, than he will when they beat Card when they beat Cardiff or or when they beat Hull or when they beat Birmingham. Who, you know, you only have to look at their league position. Norwich's record against teams in in, in that position has has been pretty positive. So. That I think is is where we're at, and and that's why I'm I'm probably very very keen not to be too reactive after this result because I, and and look fans are, are more than entitled to to be reactive. It's what they're there for to to re, to respond and go in two footed completely on emotions. But I think there's there's been a lot of that this season, and actually I think the the position that that we've kind of adopted is this defeat is not the end of the world, but it does raise probably questions and and, and maybe. Um, those questions reappear is, is maybe a better way of saying it because they're questions that have persisted throughout this season and the body of evidence of this group shows that inconsistency. So there's, there's, there's kind of no point us discussing why that is the case or how David Wagner turns it around because we've seen two coaches try and they haven't been able to. I think we're now, and, and again, we've alluded to this a few podcasts ago, you're at the stage where it feels like it needs something bigger than that. And, and, and I'll just add as well for, for balance that um, as I was packing up for from the game and, and, and getting ready to go and speak to Angus Gunn. There were a couple of of guys working for, for national radio behind me as well who, who, who spoke about the fact and that they obviously don't watch Norwich every week, speaking about the fact that this is a Norwich team that felt like it was at the end of its cycle. And every team goes through this kind of process as well. Um, and that there was there was kind of change needed. So it's not just a an insular view. It, it feels like it's an external view as well. And that's going to be really interesting for... For, for the running, I guess, but but I did want to touch upon that that kind of reactivity to results, pad because and I know Stuart Weber mentioned it as well in in a recent interview that he did, where you know if t- if a team loses a game, they are terrible, and if they if they win a game, all's well in the world. And I think we have seen that at Norwich City. It's magnified by inconsistency, obviously, but you know I saw a lot of people after last weekend jokingly, so I'm not jokingly speaking about automatic promotion, and uh, and it is easy to to get carried away with a result, and it is easy now after this defeat to say they're terrible they're not going to make the playoffs it's 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 not as straightforward as that it's not as clear cut as that you have to accept as we have that this is an inconsistent group which again you you then have to draw out probably makes automatic promotion not real I'm not sure it's ever realistic anyway but that's that's not going to happen so it's it's almost that application of reason throughout this I, I think which is which some uh, feel like they're going to have to learn and maybe adapt with a little bit better rather than whenever this group gets caught up in a defeat, absolutely hammering them for it because that's kind of what they are and, and they've shown that. And you can have a conversation at the end of the season about why that is and maybe who needs to be accountable for that. But in the here and now, it does feel like, you know, and, and maybe this is more for Wagner and his, and his players, as we've alluded to, rather than fans because they can, as I said, they're there to emotionally respond to it. But it does feel like there needs a little bit more... Uh, I don't know the word, but certainly more kind of reason in the way that, that I guess maybe we are involved in this as well, in, in the way that we analyse Norwich City this season. But it has been very difficult because of the roller coaster that they've been on in this season alone, in the last few months alone. Well, what I would say on that is before a ball was kicked, you know, from inside the club, the messaging was clear. And that was 
this group of players, in their opinion, are good enough to target yeah. automatic promotion. So, you know, that isn't an artificially um, created uh, expectation level. You know, that's come from the people who are shaping this inside that football club. So you take that and that that then, whether it's media or whether it's fans, is... I think the acceptable sort of uh, measure to 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 rate them against, and and clearly, you know, Dean Smith departs um, with much bitterness and toxicity uh, and a divide with the fan base, and they were off the top of my head. I think they were sort of hovering around tenth, maybe just slightly ahead of tenth position. Palpably, you draw a line between what the pre-season expectation was set by the club and where they were at that point early in January. Nowhere near, and and I think a lot of, a lot of the, kind of assessment of this group is filtered through that. That is it. Is it still on that pre-season expectation? Well, it shouldn't be now. No, it shouldn't be now. But, I think, but do you feel that is the case? That well, we well, hear it all the time, and we hear it from well, opposition managers about how this that, how this group is primarily great. Yeah, that does add to it. I mean, I, I mean, I could if I stopped to think about it, I could probably reel off about ten press conferences with opposition managers I've been in. Um, where it's you know usually like, after they've beaten Norwich as well. By yeah, far. <laughs> although to be fair, I mean right, that Preston boss Ryan Lowe, yeah. which was Wagner's first first win, uh, first league win. Sorry, I mean he said they were uh, they were on a par with you know, or they were they were a top three outfit in his opinion. I'm just trying to think. Mill, yeah, Rowett wasn't it? Rowett last week yeah. um, said with and without the ball, they're as good on their day as Burnley. Now Burnley are the standout team in this division, um, so you know. That all probably does flow into it, even though for me, I mean, once we got to the stage where they're making a change of manager and the new incumbent is picking up a team who were uh, listing badly um, nearer mid-table, nearer the bottom end than they were the top end, then I, from from my perspective, then then you have to reset the expectation levels. And, and it, it certainly was no longer for me at that point um, about automatic, even though, you know, of course, with the run that had been on um, and Sheffield United faltering slightly. I mean, we had it on the, the team news live today before the game. Win today, they're only nine points behind, as if nine points was still achievable. Gap to close to Sheffield United at this stage. I mean, absolutely no chance of that happening. I think Middlesbrough would still harbour their automatic promotion hopes, but not for Norwich, no way. Um, so, for me certainly since Smith's departure and probably before it, it was always a reset of that initial pre-season benchmark to to top six. And and with that should probably be a lowering in expectation from what you what you think this group is able to achieve because you shouldn't really now be measuring them against essentially what you're saying if you say top two is a title winning squad or a, a squad good enough to win the title. This group isn't that. Um, and also probably now I've mentioned that the fact that the last two times a Norwich City collective did win the title I don't think that helps in terms of expectation um, you know if you extrapolated Norwich's championship record over the previous 10 years then you probably wouldn't start from such a lofty perch to benchmark this group of players you know what we saw under Farker was the exception it was an extraordinary period of championship dominance Um and it was probably unreal, and that was probably unrealistic and unfair on Smith to to sort of expect him to to meet that type of uh, title winning sort of um, you know th- for a third time running in 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 this league. But you know, so for me, no, I think I think there is a I think there has been a, a realism um, amongst the fan base uh, uh, and and the media, certainly local media anyway, that that you know. I think you do need to now look at this group and and lower your expectations of this group. But clearly, you know, they're still very much in the conversation to be in the playoffs. And if you're in the playoffs, then you've got a one in four chance. It's it's the mathematics of it all to to join the other two in the Premier League. So in terms of promotion, yeah, they, 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 they still would appear to have a group of players who are capable of being in the conversation for the top six right away to the end of the season. But... Um, I think you know any notion that you know the, the the pre-season benchmark is now being applied to this group. I don't think that washes really. I think um, you know that is separate to this kind of high when they win, low when they lose uh, mentality. I, th- I just think that's more broadly 
football in general, isn't it? And, and that's probably, I think, what Weber was alluding to. And maybe he he wanted to draw parallels with maybe society in general, that, we're, that, that it's the instant craving and everything has to be black or white. There's no shades of grey. And that clearly isn't the case in life or in football, certainly professional football. So, no, I, th- I think there is enough realism Um but you're always going to, and it's amplified by social media immediately after games as well, you're always going to get that sort of lurch to one extreme or the other in terms of how you interpret a performance or a result. And inevitably, I'm sure, in the hours after today's game, you know, there will be there will be some very hard opinions being formed. But equally, uh, you know, as Wagner said, you know, he didn't get carried away after Millwall. He's not going to get carried away after Sunderland. And I guess it's just maintaining that balance as hard as it is whether it's players, whether it's head coach, whether it's media, whether it's fans, as hard as it is to do, that's basically where we are now. That you know There are flaws in this group. We've seen them again today and, and you have to accept that but hope that over the entirety of these remaining 10 league games, they're counteracted by the good things, which inevitably there are in this group. You know The good individual players they have, when they're, when they're, they're on it, um, they can score goals. They can score goals. They have goal-scoring potential. They can, although you know it didn't look like it in spells today. They can defensively show themselves to be fairly robust as well uh, under Wagner. So, you know, I think it's a case now that the realism is there, but you just hope that the the good outweighs the negative. And and if if they get that sample right, that will be enough to carry them into the playoffs. And then, then you're just hoping it all comes together. But it does still feel a little bit more hope than, than expectation that that's going to be the, the scenario that's going to unfold over these next 10 league games. Yeah, and and just to be clear, I'm absolutely not blaming supporters for that. I think it's it's completely natural and, and you can only respond to what you see on the pitch, right? So, But I, I think that, you know, as we alluded to earlier, there's been a nature of that in, in their performances that when there are lows, they have been low themselves. When there are highs... You can see visibly them them growing confidence, and maybe that is wider issues about last season and about the scarring that it created. And just because, certainly in terms of fans, just because they're being asked to lower their expectations of this group, I don't think that means that they need to accept that or not have an anger about that or not have a willingness for some accountability as to why that lowering has happened. I think those are all still very pertinent and real questions. I think it's just that it obviously needs to happen between now and the end of the season if there is to be this kind of togetherness that David Wagner wants and has has been trying to cultivate. And and ultimately, it's up to to him and the uh, and the players to do that. Let's look ahead to to this week then, Pat, because we've we've kind of touched upon it. I don't know why the idea of Huddersfield in midweek, Neil Warnock team battling relegation scares the life out of me. To be honest, then uh, then I don't know why a Norwich may well come through it, but. Then Stoke at, at the weekend, Alex Neil, they've just come off the back of beating this Sunderland team who are here today, 5-1. Um, they, they obviously beat Blackburn as well, 3-2. They went 3-0 up over them, so they're running a little bit hot at the moment. I don't think this is perhaps as, as clear-cut a two games, perhaps, as maybe some people and, and certainly maybe even the league table would suggest it may be. No, I mean, I didn't see anything other than the result against West Brom, but apparently Huddersfield were a little bit... Hard done by there, wasn't they? I think there yeah, was... I think they should have had a penalty. But yeah. if you've got Neil Warnock, I think you should have had a penalty every game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he, yeah, it it feels like quite quite a tricky couple of games now, um, and they would have been anyway. But 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 off the back of this and and how this will have to be managed and come through the other side. Um, of course, there's the Wagner factor going back to yeah. Huddersfield for the first time. You know, I'm sure he'll get the reception. He, he's uh, he's he should be afforded for what he did at that club, you know, in contrast to Daniel Farker, you know, uh, if you could say too unexpected, certainly the first time around in the Daniel Championship promotions, but unlike Daniel, David Wagner was able to keep Huddersfield in the, the division, which was arguably a bigger achievement than getting them out of the championship in the first place. So I'd imagine he's, um, you know, he's something akin to a godlike status up there. So, you know, it, it'll deserve a reception, but guaranteed that'll end at the start of the start of the game under Warnock because they're in dire straits themselves in terms of trouble at the bottom of the table so it's going to be a horrible game that it really is it's going to be Wigan-esque again and and Norwich troublingly uh, were not able to get a grip of the Wigan game at all and and but for Angus Gunn they'd have lost that game so you know I think they're going to get asked some searching questions on Wednesday night and um 
Warnock will try to do everything in his in his power to make that as horrible and as uncomfortable uh, an evening as he can for for, for David Wagner and, and that Norwich team. And if they don't come up with the right answers, then you know there'll be no sympathy shown from Alex Neil either. I can assure you that. So so then you know let's not try and finish on a downer. But but if you're limping into the international break and you've not won any of these three games, um. Uh, then inevitably, uh, I think you know you're pretty you're pretty close to saying Sheffield United's must win territory then on the other side, and uh, and that's probably not a scenario that you want to uh, to in, to envisage at this stage. So these are two massive games now for, for a lot of reasons, but but certainly in the bigger context of you know if they're going to sustain a, a, a tilt at the playoffs, um, they need to be taking four and ideally six points, and uh, yeah. Uh, right now, um, after what we've seen this this afternoon, um, I, you know, I'd be I'd be concerned that they could they could return south uh, from two trips up north with with that haul, and um, and if they don't, then you know, just to, just to backtrack slightly, you know, you know, when when it is time to measure this season, then if they don't get promoted, that is failure because that you know, as much as we're saying we we can we, we've been basically. Well, I, I think there's, as I said earlier, I think there's an argument that some will make that even if they go up through the playoffs, that's 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 well, a failure too. And it's as harsh as that. Yeah, as that, that may, be, maybe a slightly be, watered yeah. down version of, of failure, yeah. but there, there is that argument given the benchmark that was set on this group, which was top two, really. Well, well, but I mean, if ultimately the end destination, yeah, is no one will care. Yeah, but, no. you know. but but I would I wouldn't dispute at all if they fail to go up this season. Um, that is failure because the stated aim was promotion. So there's no there's no other way of cutting that. And that's the problem, isn't it? When you make things, uh, you, you spoke about black, yeah. white, and grey. But when you make it as black and white as oh, that, yeah. that's the problem. That that is the problem. Sometimes you're yeah. you're, you're going to finish on I don't know what what would be the worst of, of black and white on that. On that. I'll let people decide. But whichever end you fall of that, if yeah. you don't do it, you kind of open yourself up for criticism. You do, but then that's kind of you know almost. They would turn that to be, you know, well, this is our aim. We're going to be bullish about this. We're going to come out on the front for the response to relegation. You don't really want to, well, we'll have a go. And if it comes off, all well and good. I'm sure your fan base want that messaging, that positive messaging, that we'll do everything in our power to equip that manager with the squad of players that we think are good enough to do what we did two times before, the last two times in this league, uh, if not win the title, but certainly get promoted. Um so I think they had to. I, I don't see any other way that they couldn't have come out and said that um, because that was the expectation level. You know, they'd spent considerable sums of money. Didn't happen in the Premier League for them, but they still, we all felt, were coming back down a level with a group of players who should have been good enough for my money to to be better than seventh in the table as they are this evening. So not the time for the inquest now, but when it is the time, there will be some serious questions to answer and, and accountability will have to be apportioned and responsibility um, if it proves that, that they're not able to get even in the top six shake-up when, as, as we've laboured the point, top two was the aim at the outset by the club themselves. So, um, yeah, so it's a massive week, massive week now. And, um, you know, I'm sure if, if we, we had Wagner here now, because he is such a positive character, he'd be flipping that and saying, well, massive week, but what a lift it would give us in this group and that fan base if we come back down that road with with two point two wins, uh, six points in the bag, um, because it will have answered some of the questions that have been flared up again after Sunderland. And that's how he needs to view it. That's how his players, more importantly, need to view it. Um, it's an opportunity now. You know, I'm sure once they get past the next 24 hours, they will want to come back out as quick as they can. And they've got an opportunity now on Wednesday um, to really put what happened on Sunday today behind them and uh, and put a positive step forward again because that that's where they need to be. And if, if they don't, then, you know, pretty short order, we'll have our definitive answer about this group of players. Yeah, completely. Um, it's it's going to be a really interesting week. Well, obviously, the next time we sit down to record a podcast, will be after Stoke. So goodness knows what the uh, what the land or the the state of the land will be come uh, come that podcast. Two really really tricky tests, but two tests that absolutely I agree feel like Norwich City need to extract certainly four points out. But I think you could probably even argue a six. But that's uh, that's the, 
the the kind of season that we're in. A couple of things I did want to mention at the at the back end of the pod. I don't know if we've mentioned this actually since it's been announced, uh, which I think would have been last week. I'm not sure we did. The women's team are going to play at Carrow Road in April. Really, uh, really nice to go down to to Carrow Road early this week and, and speak to Flo Allen. So there's uh, that interview across our channels if if you'd like to read that. Speaking about the occasion, I think they've already sold three thousand tickets, haven't they? But that's uh, uh, the 16th of April, I believe. Um, it's going to be uh, a really good occasion and, and, and a really historic occasion as well for Norwich City women to, to be playing uh, their final home league game at Carroll Road um, and nice that it's uh, it's been done I think we've we've been gently encouraging it for for a little while but the the other thing I wanted to mention is is obviously the the sad news and we had a, a moment to applause at, at the game today um, about the the death of former Norwich City chairman Robert Chase at the age of uh, of eighty four last Friday, um, it was eventually com- uh, was confirmed on on Monday, wasn't it? Monday, Tuesday, Monday, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think there's there's been a lot of reflection. It's interesting how things can can get judged, maybe with with the the beauty of time, which maybe haven't been there, but. I think it's what three top five finishes. Obviously, a historic European campaign, a Bayern Munich win, uh, redevelopment of the the city stand, the transition from Traus to Colney. I mean, there's a lot of achievements packed in there. Obviously, it didn't end, and and you have to recognise all of the controversies as well. And there, there were plenty of controversies with with Robert Chase. Even he's not my era. I wasn't I wasn't born when 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 he was in charge of Norwich City. But he is a name that is absolutely kind of threaded in the Norwich City history isn't it and always will be a, a really colourful figure whether whichever side I guess of, of the fence that you sat on but those achievements you, you just cannot argue with as, as an era of time for from a Norwich City perspective even with the, the maybe controversies and the way it ended which you know it's fair to say is often the way it ends for, for figureheads in football it's very rarely rare that, that figureheads leave a football club in it and it all being very amicable. No, but I mean you, you've listed the achievements and you know some of the things that you know didn't go in his favour. But but what a body of work, you know what an in, what an indelible mark he left on that football club. And you know I guess it depends which side of the, the fence you want to sit in terms of his his longer term legacy. But you know the the people who I've spoken obviously before my time as well. But the people I've spoken to who were around at that point, one thing they they do sort of agree is that you know. Whether you agreed with what he did in certain situations, you didn't agree. He, he always acted, in his view, in the best best interest of the football club, and that's surely all you can you can ask from the people who are the custodians of the football club. And you know, to bring it full circle, you know, the 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 the, the two who majority owners who have been at the club for twenty five plus years now. Again, you know, if they, if they, and it's entirely plausible, obviously, because we know the whole situation in terms of the the changing, ever ever evolving sort of shareholder dynamic with Mark Atanasio and his group. We don't know, obviously, at the speed that's going to progress from here. But if there's a point in not too too distant time where Delia and Michael uh, were to depart, I'm sure we'd have a similar type of dissection of of their tenure. They'd be good. They'd be bad. There'd be, you know, people who were pro them, people who were anti them, uh, and that's just the nature of it. But but ultimately, like with Chase, I would like to think that any any decisions they reached, any sort of direction of travel they set the club on, was always with the club's best interests at heart in the short, the medium, and the longer term. And um, you know, if if I was an Orange fan, then that's what I would want from the people who are shaping the destiny of my, of my football club is that. Ultimately, they acted in the what they felt were the best interests of their club, rather than you know, any anything else, anything commercial, anything selfishly individual. You know, they they tried always, and they didn't always get things right. As you say, not surely anybody with that longevity, certainly in football, are not going to get everything right. Um, but you cannot argue with the longer lasting legacy of the Chase era. And and I'm not even talking about on the pitch. I mean, what would they give now for three top five finishes in the top division? I mean that's you can't that's just a that's a period in time that if he wasn't around at that point, you, you can scarcely believe, given the struggles they've had in recent years in the Premier League, that, that, that was even a thing that that, that happened, uh, that level of competing against the elite of English football. Um but off the pitch for me it's and it's been taken on by Stuart Webber, obviously primarily in the in the recent years, that development of Colney, but without Chase there isn't a Colney. Um and, and the parcels of land that he he purchased in and around Car Road as well. You know, the astuteness of him as a businessman, um 
I don't think you can underestimate. And of course, yeah, he didn't get everything right. And, and there's plenty of fans who um, would tell you, you know, that his his legacy was forever tainted by how it ended. Um, but ultimately, as I say, you know, I can only go on the people who were around at the time and who now maybe with the passage of time can can accurately place his achievements in their proper historical context. And I've not met anybody since um, the sad news of his passing who felt that, on balance, um, his legacy will be a good one for Norwich City. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously, we would like to extend our condolences as well to his uh, his family, his children, um, everyone who, who who knew him, his friends, and uh, and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it was uh, a lovely uh, a lovely moment of applause that uh, he he got a car road, even as you mentioned, despite maybe some of the the controversy that that is often associated to his name. So um, there we go. Big week ahead for for Norwich City. We will of course be at Huddersfield. We'll be at Stoke as well, and uh, we'll bring you the next edition of the podcast after that game uh, against Alex Neal's side. Feels like a big week. <laughs> Goodness knows what Norwich City we're, we're going to get, but um, it's not going to be dull, I don't think. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again very, very soon.